What will war be like in the future? Future conflicts will be very different from those of the past. It'll take a new set of tools to fight rogue nations armed with nuclear weapons, to sniff out and combat insurgent groups hiding among civilian populations, to track down terrorists armed with bombs, rockets, even weapons of mass destruction. Many of the new tools to fight these new enemies are on the drawing board now. Some have already been deployed. The time, a day in the not too distant future. A giant Global Hawk unmanned aerial vehicle stalks the skies above hostile terrain. Picking up its quarry, it sends images and coordinates to ground troops, advancing against enemy positions. A small unmanned aerial scout is launched to survey the area and beam the coordinates to an Army forward command post. Simultaneously, the information is fed to the Aegis missile guidance system aboard a DDG-1000 destroyer 50 miles off the coast, to helicopters ferrying troops and equipment to the battlefront, and to the commander back at Allied headquarters, thousands of kilometers away. From the decks of a CVN-class aircraft carrier, an unmanned aerial combat vehicle, an armed version of the smaller reconnaissance drones, takes off to join the battle. The information from all these sources is analyzed. A battle plan is drawn up. Sir, all ships are ready to commence fire. Positions of forward friendly lines confirmed clear. Request plan approval and batteries released. All stations, Captain. Firing plan is approved. SAG batteries released. In a burst of smoke and fire, the destroyer launches long-range land attack projectiles. Under the sea, a Virginia-class submarine fires a cruise missile toward targets farther inland. F-35 Joint Strike Fighters arrive on scene to provide close air support for landing and advancing troops. From 100 miles away, a hypersonic cruise missile locks on target. Land-based future combat systems coordinate the operation, crunching numbers and calculating target parameters. New technologies, networked information systems, Sophisticated sensors, smart munitions, and stealthy designs in manned and unmanned platforms. It's all part of the future of warfare and the new technology of war. The future of warfare has already begun. As today's military evolves on the drawing board and in the laboratory, ultra-advanced technology is reshaping our vision of tomorrow's battle space. We already know it will be different from anything we could have imagined only a few short years ago. The fast track to the future of warfare is network-centric. The military is close to realizing the biggest communications network in history. A network that will link data and communications with forces at sea, on land, in the air, and in space, merging them into a single command structure. In the future, battle managers will be able to choose from a menu of ships, planes, missiles, personnel, armored vehicles, and unmanned platforms selecting the most effective options as a situation unfolds. Behind this system of systems is the same technology that has transformed the civilian world, high-performance computing. The military is developing highly sophisticated hardware, and it has to find new ways to coordinate all of its manpower and machinery for real-world conflict. So it's harnessing advanced computer power to overcome the most complex challenges in design and engineering. How has nature, through four billion years of evolution, engineered exquisite solutions 
to practical problems. And then if we can understand those, can we then create human engineered versions that could help us in solving other problems that we have. High performance computing is the key to the future of warfare. High performance computing is really the use of the fastest, most powerful, scalable computers in the world to be able to do real science, to solve the equations of motion of airflow, to solve the structural mechanics equations. Typically when you run high performance uh, computing calculations for physics-based simulations, you wind up with a bunch of numbers. Um, as opposed to just re going through those numbers, what you'd like to do is see them visually. To help make sense of the numbers, high performance computers are able to translate them into highly realistic 3D visualizations. From a practical standpoint, let's take a piece of armor. A piece of armor may be made of many layers, um, and the, the analyst wants to know whether the projectile will or will not make it through the piece of armor. They run their calculation, and they can see whether the projectile will, will make it through or will be stopped by the armor. The simulation allows designers to get right inside the soldier's armor to find out how well its ceramic plates resist a bullet's impact. By doing this on the computer numerically, you know, you can design all different cases. Okay, well, it defeated this type of armor. What if we made the ceramic, you know, maybe 30% thicker? You can do that on the computer, just basically change one parameter, do another run, and within a day, see the results of that simulation. And then you can go back and forth. Maybe the aluminum needs to be thicker, or maybe the tile needs to be thicker altogether. And you can see in this case, the armor does defeat the projectile. It does not, the core, the steel core there in blue, does not penetrate the armor. Technology is now taking us beyond visualizations. What we're doing now is we're using the other senses, using uh, your hearing, sound, and also tactile feedback, the feeling that you get uh, to explore those. So you can look at more dimensions of data. As opposed to just looking through things through color, uh, time, and X, Y, and Z, you can now hear things and you can feel things. What you're looking at is called uh, a reality sandwich. With this transparent screening material, it's the only way to project virtual things in front of real objects. So what you're seeing is a virtual representation of some scalars that are on this XM1002 120 millimeter training round. And also projected is a cutaway of the M1A1 tank. Uh, what we're looking at is a uh, simulation of the dynamics, of the inboard dynamics uh, of the gun tube as the uh, projectile travels down. With typical visualization, you could only see X, Y, Z, time, and a computed scalar. In this case, the computer scalar is something called radial velocity. In other words, how the projectile is moving down the gun tube. What you can hear also now is something we've added. We've added sound to yet another variable, okay, or the derivative of the uh, radial velocity. In other words, when it changes direction, how it's balloting down the gun tube. And what you can feel underneath your feet is something called infrasound. It's the shaking of the floor. And what that is, we've tied that to the stress the gun tube feels as the projectile goes through. It starts out shaking a lot and the shake dies off. So what's that telling you is that the stress on the gun tube is greatest as the projectile is first fired and then it dies off. So in this way, we're actually looking at seven different dimensions of the same data set. But using high performance computing to design weapons is just part of the story. The high performance computing will be embedded in everything around us. It'll be embedded in the soldier uniform, it'll be embedded into ground vehicles, whether they're manned or unmanned, unmanned air vehicles. It will be everywhere, it'll be ubiquitous. Now the impact that that has is in the processing of information. Being able to process large amounts of information in shorter and shorter periods of time. And there's a lot of information on the modern battlefield. So much information, so many moving parts, and such high risks, the only way to deal with it all is to merge that information into a unified picture, an integrated battle space. These days, computers can talk to each other and process data at the speed of light, and communications technology has gotten smaller, more powerful, and more portable. It's a further extension of the high-tech revolution, which now makes it possible to link military forces scattered around the globe. 
The U.S. and its allies will use these systems for rapid deployment of military forces anywhere on Earth, forces that are technologically more advanced than ever before. Over the last decade, we have inserted a lot of electronics into our systems, upgraded our systems, so that they have embedded computers and electronics that provide information on the battlefield. They provide the ability then to plan and execute missions more effectively, uh, provide more effective sensor and targeting data to our weapons platforms so that we can do a better job of applying the right weapon to the right target at the right time. The military's goal is what it calls the integrated battle space, using sensors and communications technology to paint a complete picture of the combat zone, identifying ships and planes, weapons, vehicles and personnel, even weather conditions. Then that picture will be sent to everyone involved, from headquarters to field commanders, from ships at sea to boots on the ground to pilots overhead. Everyone will be able to see the same battlefield, recognize the same targets, and accurately track friend and foe alike. In the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, for example, the Navy implemented the integrated battle space concept, taking control of sea and airspace through its own real-time tracking system called Aegis. With its computer-controlled SPY-1E radar, Aegis can track more than 100 targets simultaneously, sweeping the surrounding waters, skies, and land. It gives commanders an overview of the total battlefield so they can respond in an instant. It's absolutely critical to have what we call knowledge superiority. Uh, and the simple way to describe that is that we know more than any, any of our enemies do about what's going on. And to do that, we have to have, obviously, better sensors, better intelligence, uh, better methods of communication, uh, better methods of pulling that information together. For the Air Force, too, knowledge superiority means tracking the enemy wherever it may be. We've moved toward looking at a technical vision, which goes something like the following. It will be to anticipate, find, fix, target, track, engage, assess, anyone, anywhere, anytime at sea, in the air, or on the ground. Situational awareness is crucial. But another key to victory is logistical, getting forces in place and keeping them alive. In a distant war zone, an unmanned probe has revealed the location of an enemy base. The intelligence report is relayed to a forward command post. With robotic eyes in the sky, commanders can direct the action from 20 miles over 30 kilometers away. It's time to add the human element, boots on the ground, for a closer look. Armed with precise coordinates from the Global Positioning System, a brigade combat team moves into position and surrounds the base. A team of robots, along with unmanned aerial drones, moves in to target the enemy. Armored infantry vehicles spearhead the assault as automated launch modules pour on the heat. This is a generational leap to integrate precision weaponry with the future combat system. They include uh, manned and unmanned vehicles. They include uh, very high-tech uh, artillery, manned and unmanned. They include um, unmanned aerial vehicles, which will be eyes in the sky, and an assortment of high-tech weaponry, which basically will allow you to fight the battle over the horizon. Information technology will give ground forces an advantage by linking ground vehicles, manned and unmanned systems, and troops. But success on the ground will require new capabilities in the air. Today's jet fighters, like the F-15 and F-16, and the newly deployed F-22, can fly much faster than the speed of sound, reaching velocities of close to Mach 2.5, about 1,600 miles per hour at sea level. But in the future, 
a new class of engine might push the speed limit even further. We're going beyond that today. We're developing a supersonic combustion ramjet, or scramjet, that can operate from Mach 4 to Mach 7 on conventional jet fuels. That could also be extended to higher speeds up to about Mach 14 if we were to switch to hydrogen as a fuel. Once they pass Mach 5, tomorrow's fighters won't be supersonic, they'll be hypersonic. The key to those high speeds is the way the scramjet engine pulls in and burns air. The design of the scramjet forces air into the combustion chamber, where fuel is burned, without slowing it down first to subsonic speed. That direct combustion translates into a faster burn and blinding velocities. And the scramjet has other applications besides fighter planes. This technology is a pervasive technology. The near-term application is for a hypersonic cruise missile that can destroy time-critical targets or take advantage of the high speed at which it flies to hit the ground at higher velocities and increase the depth of penetration to go after hardened or deeply buried targets. What this system would allow us to do for a time-critical target is to be able to fly about 600 nautical miles in 10 minutes. That would be equivalent to being out over Indianapolis launching and having a missile over Washington, D.C. in 10 minutes' time. If you look at various areas in which we have been operating, you could sit off over the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, and be able to hold targets at bay throughout most of an enemy's country without ever putting our aircraft at risk. While hypersonic jets and missiles will travel at Mach 10 or beyond, one of the most crucial technological breakthroughs in the air will continue to be a much slower craft, unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs. They're not much to look at, oddly shaped, lumbering, defenseless. But the U.S. and its allies are betting that UAVs will become the linchpin of tomorrow's arsenal. The United States and coalition forces in Iraq and Afghanistan scored successes with unmanned aircraft, locating enemy positions and then striking with the UAV's Hellfire missiles. UAVs can fly anywhere and stay aloft for long periods without putting a human pilot at risk. Their electronic eyes can monitor what's going on far below or track targets and send alerts back to ship or shore. UAVs can also provide non-stop escort service for a fleet in hazardous seas or patrol a coastline to spot terrorist activity or enemy landings. What has really evolved and enabled things to change dramatically was the revolution in information technology. So the kind of sensors and the kind of intelligence that we can put on board these machines has really enabled the current revolution that we see today that you know, comes from predators, now global hawks. Joining the next generation of UAVs will be unmanned fighter jets that won't look or behave like manned fighters. Without a pilot on board, they can be smaller and can operate at speeds and G-forces no human could safely withstand. Unlike the UAVs in today's arsenal, whose flight systems and weapons are controlled by a distant operator, the unmanned fighter of the future will actually be programmed to fly itself. It can work alone or as part of an unmanned squadron. The future is to look out toward a different vision where you have teams of UAVs that cooperate and work with each other, share information, share intelligence, share decisions on what target to attack with a human supervisor, but not someone who's directly touching the loop. Within a decade, one third of tactical aircraft may be unmanned. But traditional aircraft will still play a major role. As the military branches become more closely integrated, the Air Force will lead the way in transporting troops in and out of hostile territory. The Army will talk to their future combat system and their battle units that are in there. They want to be able to more rapidly reconstitute and move those, as opposed to now having to take something over on a ship, maybe put it onto a smaller plane and move it. We want to load them up in the States and basically go fort the foxhole. So you use all your different sensor modalities. You go out and you cue the overhead assets and say, look for a space that's 2,000 feet of runway. Find that space that's got the ground stiff enough that I can be able to land on it. Survey around it, making sure I'm not dropping into the enemy's camp. 
then I'm going to be able to fly in, have defensive measures on that plane, be survivable enough to be able to engage through that, come in and be able to land in zero, zero weather. Can't even see what I'm doing without unaided sensors. Put them down, kick them out, get them back out of there, come back, pick them up, move them maybe another couple hundred miles to where they want to be. So very quickly again, have this persistence of action and responsiveness kind of capability. And those attributes, the combination of short takeoff and landing, the ability to be survivable and high transonic speeds are not something you can find today. New technologies are revolutionizing how future wars will be fought on the ground and in the air. Meanwhile, at sea, naval warfare is going through its own revolution. Tomorrow's Navy will be radically transformed with ships that fight, move, and look unlike anything we've ever seen before. In the past, most warships were designed to face off with enemy ships in the open sea or bombard an enemy's coastline from miles offshore. Today, the threat from guerrilla-style warfare is forcing navies to develop faster, more flexible ships. One of them looks and operates like nothing in today's fleets. The FSF-1 Sea Fighter is the vessel previously designated the X-Craft by the Office of Naval Research. It's an experimental vessel being used to test technology for the littoral combat ship. It has an aluminum catamaran designed to operate at high speed in shallow coastal waters. With its twin hulls, it can maneuver in water that's only 11 feet deep. The Sea Fighter's flexible design makes it a multi-purpose craft. More than a dozen different mission modules can be housed in the ship's mission bay. It can be reconfigured for jobs ranging from mine sweeping to anti-submarine warfare, supporting amphibious assaults or humanitarian missions. At the stern, or rear, there's a ramp for launching and recovering manned or unmanned craft, inflatable boats or remotely operated submarines. There's even a flight deck for H-60 helicopters and vertical takeoff and landing unmanned aerial vehicles. To keep the Sea Fighter stealthy, many of its internal surfaces are coated with a substance called Quiet Ship, which reduces vibration and cuts noise by up to 70%. The Sea Fighter is faster and more agile than bigger conventional ships. It's more like a sports car, reaching a top speed of 50 knots. Its four Rolls-Royce water jet engines can operate independently, so the Sea Fighter is extremely maneuverable. It can even move sideways. In traditional warships, as in other combat vehicles, the propulsion system is kept separate from the weapon systems. In other words, the power that makes them move is not available for detecting or fighting the enemy. But that paradigm is about to change. On the drawing board is a new generation of all-electric warships and combat vehicles. They'll generate large amounts of energy, energy that can be directed to any purpose, including weapons and sensors. It's a revolution in the design of vehicles, submarines, surface ships, and land vehicles toward fully integrated models that are more efficient, more effective, and more survivable. In an integrated power system, Electricity provides the energy for propulsion. Then, when it's needed, it's shifted on demand to run radar and sonar, launch systems, or even newer types of electric-powered weapons. When the next-generation all-electric destroyer, the DDG-1000, is commissioned, which is estimated to be in the year 2012, it will be armed with the latest conventional weaponry. But these weapons will be replaced in the future by an advanced arsenal now in development. One class of armament, directed energy weapons, may one day use high energy sources like microwaves, electronic pulses, and lasers. These weapons might be able to disable or destroy enemy ships, or even shoot down missiles or planes. Electric ships will also feature a lethal technology that's actually been on the drawing boards for more than 75 years, the railgun. We thought we invented it to find out that there was uh, a Philadelphia electric gun company in the 1920s. There's a patent by Birkeland in Norway 
in 1900. And so people tried over the years to develop electric guns. Uh, there was a, a, an effort by the Germans in the Second World War. Uh, and the technology simply was not available to do it. So we began this effort on a small scale uh, about 20 years ago, a little well, longer than that now. Uh, and we've systematically worked our way through the issues. Here's how a rail gun works. The gun's two parallel metal rails are connected to an electric current. That generates electromagnetic fields around the rails. When a projectile made of conductive material is placed between the rails, it completes the circuit. That triggers a phenomenon called the Lorentz effect, forcing energy outward. That energy launches the projectile towards its target. In this case, we're generating electromagnetic fields, electromagnetic forces, and it's the interaction of the electromagnetic field and the current in this kind of electric gun that accelerates the projectile and we can get much, much higher velocities. We can get velocities six or seven kilometers a second. That's five or six times faster than you get with a conventional uh, gas gun. In fact, the projectile can move so fast and with so much kinetic energy, an explosive warhead isn't needed. In tests, a railgun has generated enough force to shoot a tungsten rod through the armor of a tank. Another big advantage is the railgun's long range. The U.S. Navy has plans to deploy railguns with ranges greater than 250 miles, or 400 kilometers. So you shoot through the atmosphere, the projectile then flies for 500 kilometers in space. 80% of the flight is in space. The projectile re-enters and loses again through drag, but it still impacts with a velocity higher than the highest conventional gun that we now make. Ironically, even as advanced technology makes weapons more lethal, it will also make warfare safer for the warrior. That will be especially true when battles are fought by remote control. This is the future of warfare, hunting enemies by remote control with blinding speed and limited risk to friendly forces. Many elements of a long-range strike force will be unmanned and highly mobile. Sea-based Predator UAVs will fly with a carrier group. On land, miniature UAVs will be carried in a backpack and launched like a model airplane when a soldier needs to see what's just over the hill. Convoys and patrols will be equipped with remote-controlled vehicles that can probe suspicious roadside objects and detonate bombs from a safe distance before they can harm troops. One of the biggest payoffs of these robotic devices is that they'll take the big risks while soldiers, sailors, and pilots stay out of harm's way. In the Cold War, spy satellites were developed to track enemy forces from outer space and intercontinental ballistic missiles were built to level cities from thousands of miles away and serve as the ultimate deterrent to war. But those large-scale strategic tools won't work in the new age of terrorism. Terrorists are hard to find, sometimes hidden among innocent civilian populations. Countering the terrorist threat requires surgical strikes in hostile territory an ideal arena for robotic warriors. I can have a uh, unmanned air vehicle flying 10 miles away from the battlefield spot a target. Uh, they can relay their video imagery to a control room on the other side of the planet. They can get global positioning system coordinates for the specific target, radio those back to an artillery unit that would be 20 miles away. They can fire a precision munition onto the target, and you can accomplish with uh, a single artillery round what in the old days would have taken dozens of artillery rounds and uh, never get close enough to the enemy that the enemy is going to be able to see you. Air Force commanders will be able to choose from a menu of UAVs, unmanned fighter planes, and manned aircraft. A normal force package that goes out will have F-35s in the future, the F-22s, and they'll each be doing a part of that in a coordinated ballet and dance the way we do today. And it shouldn't matter 
to somebody who's in there, whether that's a manned or unmanned system off their wing. That's the future battle space, one where it is seamless to somebody who's back controlling that battle, whether it's manned or unmanned. They're deciding what's the best application, what's the best system out there that can achieve the desired effect, selecting that one to be able to do it. Not all of the future fighting robots will have wings, like UAVs. In fact, robots are already deployed on today's battlefields, assisting soldiers with tasks that seem mundane, but can be dangerous. Right now, most of what we call robots are really just teleoperated uh, machines. People are driving with joysticks. In the future, robots will become more involved in day-to-day -day battlefield operations. Over the next decade, I think we're going to see increasingly high levels of autonomy in our robots where they're able to think and act for themselves. This is Crusher, developed by Carnegie Mellon University's National Robotics Engineering Center and funded by the U.S. Army and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. Crusher is a follow-up and upgrade to the spinner vehicle that was developed in a prior DARPA Army program. Crusher is a six-wheeled, all-wheel drive, hybrid electric, skid-steered, unmanned ground vehicle. Its extensive onboard sensor suite can detect close-range and mid-range hazards, allowing it to function on its own in challenging off-road terrain. Crusher's hull is made from high-strength aluminum tubes and titanium nodes, protected by a steel skid plate that can absorb shocks from impacts with rocks or tree stumps. Its unique suspension enables it to move smoothly over extremely rough terrain and overcome obstacles like large ditches, man-made barriers, or piles of boulders. Crusher weighs 14,000 pounds fully fueled and is designed to carry a 3,000 pound payload. But if need be, it can carry up to 8,000 pounds of payload and armor without compromising its mobility. Its top speed is currently 26 miles per hour. Since Crusher and its predecessor do not have to accommodate human crews, they offer unique ruggedness, mobility, and payload carrying capacity compared to manned vehicles in their weight class. In five to 10 years, robots like Crusher might be working alongside troops to protect them and help with tasks in the field. In future wars, Robots will do more than just serve in a supporting role. As amazing as it seems, they may actually provide the main fighting force. But we're already starting to talk about armed robots. Uh, if you can have an autonomous predator surveillance aircraft, you can have an autonomous armed predator. We're already talking about having armed robots on the battlefield where small robots that in the past have been used for disarming mines in the future are going to be carrying machine guns around. Robotic warriors will be efficient, expendable, and much easier to maintain than humans. And if they are injured on the battlefield, you send them back to the factory to repair them. And if they are destroyed on the battlefield, they have no family that you have to write to. And when the war is over, you shrink wrap them and store them for the next war. You don't have to feed them between wars, and so they are going to fundamentally alter uh, the way wars are fought. I don't know whether this is going to uh, take a decade from now before we start seeing this, two decades from now before we start seeing it, but I think that one can already anticipate that we are moving in the direction of having robots uh, do our killing for us. It may make it possible to tell people that you're not going to make war anymore. Uh, because any time a uh, violent conflict would escalate to the level of war, then we could send in the war bots to shut it down. If robotic warriors seem like a science fiction fantasy, wait till you see the next big thing in the arsenal of the future. Laser weapons have been a staple of Hollywood movies for decades. Lasers direct a tightly focused beam of energy against a target, like the ray guns in movies. With enough energy, the laser can be a powerful weapon, burning a hole through the metal wall of a tank or a missile, for instance. 
The Navy is in the early stages of developing an electrically powered free electron laser. It will be able to be tuned to different wavelengths to perform different functions, from locating and selecting targets to blasting them out of the sea or sky. Because a laser is so precise, it's an ideal weapon for defending a ship against airborne threats like cruise missiles. And because a laser moves at the speed of light, the target is hit before it can move out of the way. The Air Force is also getting into the laser game with an airborne laser carried on a modified 747 aircraft. Cruising at 40,000 feet or over 10 kilometers above the ground, the plane spots the plume of a rising missile and uses a tracking laser beam to lock on to the missile during its initial boost phase. Then, from a turret in the plane's nose, a powerful chemical laser weapon fires a burst and destroys the missile before it can do its damage. Another 20 years from now, we could be looking at that kind of capability to have uh, offensive and defensive lasers on fighter class aircraft. That's the vision where we're trying to take that to. And those lasers won't be chemical, they'll be more electrical or liquid kind of lasers. So you basically use your turbine engine to be able to create electricity, which powers the laser, so you, in theory, can have a more, almost an infinite magazine to fire from. Someday, laser weapons may indeed resemble the death rays from science fiction movies. And a defense strategy named after a movie may keep the United States and its allies safe from attack. A foreign threat is imminent. A rogue state is armed with ballistic missiles and is poised to launch them. Can those missiles be stopped? Long after the end of the Cold War, the world remains a dangerous place. One of the biggest dangers today and in the future, hostile nations with nuclear missiles. In response, the United States has renewed work on a controversial program begun more than two decades ago, dubbed Star Wars during President Reagan's administration. A ballistic missile defense system is intended to provide a comprehensive shield for the entire country. One small-scale version of an anti-missile defense system gained fame and notoriety during Operation Desert Storm in 1991, the Patriot Missile. In the first Gulf War, Patriot had its first combat experience, and it turned out not to work nearly as well as they had originally thought. The improved version of Patriot worked in the second Gulf War, and it looks like that actually managed to shoot down a few short-range missiles. We're still working on trying to shoot down long-range missiles. The larger goal is a global system composed of a variety of weapons that could destroy long-range ballistic missiles at any point during their flights. With the advent of new technology, it just might become a reality. Kinetic Energy Interceptors, or KEI, would strike a missile during the boost phase while it's heading up into space. Just after launch, a missile moves relatively slowly and its trajectory is fairly predictable. That makes it an easy target, if you have the right weapon. The proposed KEI system is the first ballistic missile defense system to be developed since the United States withdrew from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. The KEI consists of a mobile launcher, a command and control trailer, and an interceptor rocket. It could be flown anywhere in the world within hours and put together fast. Initially proposed as a land-based system, KEI could also be deployed on ships. After receiving a satellite report of an enemy missile launch, operators would fire a rocket to intercept it. The rocket's first stage lofts it into the upper atmosphere, then stage two fires and moves the interceptor into position. The third stage carries the weapon into space, where it continues to maneuver and track the enemy missile until it nears its intercept point. Finally, a small kinetic warhead is released. KEI is called a hit-to-kill weapon. It simply collides with the missile, using the energy generated by its own weight and speed to destroy the target. 
While KEI guards against long-range weapons, another leg of the ballistic missile defense system will patrol the seas, the Standard Missile 3, or SM-3. Mounted on board cruisers and destroyers, SM-3 will defend against short to intermediate range missiles by working with the Aegis weapon system. When you talk about ballistic missile defense, uh, because of the way that we communicate, I mean, we're part of a bigger national uh, sensor and defensive system that uh, uh, years ago we simply couldn't, uh, couldn't do. And so the information that we have organic to the ship, we can integrate with the bigger force or the bigger system and information that's available within the bigger system now becomes a, a critical element within uh, 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 individual uh, ship operations. Once an enemy missile launch is detected, Aegis will track its course, calculating its launch time and elevation, and predicting an intercept point. Then, an SM-3 will roar out of its launcher and set up radio contact with the ship. The Aegis will guide the missile through its flight into space, where its third stage will eject the nose cone, exposing the SM-3's business end, its kinetic warhead. The warhead will pinpoint the enemy missile's payload and go in for the kill, all in a matter of minutes. But will it work? Anti-missile weapons, from Patriot to the KEI and SM-3, are only effective if enemy missiles are detected in the first place. That requires sensitive new eyes on the sky, early warning sensors. One prototype space-based system is already in the works, the geosynchronous GSD satellite constellation, which will operate in low Earth orbit to provide continuous surveillance and advance warning. It's designed to detect enemy missile launches and track them throughout their flights transmitting trajectory data to Earth stations and command and control centers so they can react. On the ground, the Cobra Dane radar is located in Alaska at the western end of the Aleutian Islands. It peers deep into distant airspace to monitor a 2,000-mile corridor spanning the Pacific Rim and Southeast Asia. An even more advanced radar is based in the United Kingdom its innovative design takes in a 360-degree view to cover Europe, the Middle East, and the Atlantic. At California's Beale Air Force Base, Pave Pause radar has been in operation since 1980. It's been upgraded with new technology to improve its ability to detect and track missiles. While the Aegis system is the current state-of-the-art in sea-based radar systems, an even more advanced system is being tested. It's the sea-based X-band radar, the SBX. SBX will be able to provide detailed detection and tracking data to the ground-based missile defense system. The SBX is enormous, 280 feet tall and 390 feet long. It displaces 50,000 tons, which makes it more than three times heavier than the DDG-1000 destroyer. Its first deployment was to the waters off Alaska for testing. In the future, it could provide a crucial link in the missile defense system. Proposed anti-missile systems like the KEI and the SM-3 are great in theory, but they have been plagued by problems. They're extremely expensive, highly controversial, and so far, they've produced only limited results. We've already spent about $125 billion on missile defense over the last two decades. Uh, we spent about $125 billion on the Apollo program and managed to land on the moon. We spent about $25 billion on the Manhattan Project and got the atomic bomb. The $125 billion that we've spent on missile defense really hasn't produced very much thus far. And you have to start wondering that if you can spend so much money and have so little to show for it, that uh, maybe you're barking up the wrong tree. That maybe Mother Nature is trying to tell you something, that maybe this really is hard to do. I don't think that we're anywhere close 
to achieving a damage denial capability with missile defense. We do not appear to be anywhere close to a situation in which we can with confidence shoot down all of the nuclear-tipped missiles that somebody else is shooting at us. Perhaps one day, advanced weapons of the future will serve as a deterrent to prevent hostilities from breaking out. With the ongoing global war on terror, developing and deploying new weapons, defensive systems, and intelligence gathering technologies appears to be the best hope for maintaining security. If conflict does come, the new technology of war will be on call for our defense.